Build compelling real-time apps quickly and scale them globally with the PubNub real-time network. Only PubNub delivers the core building blocks needed for any real-time application. Find out for yourself by signing up for free today. Visit PubNub.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Untether.tv. I'm your host and founder, Rob Woodbridge. Robots. We have this vision of what a robot is. And when I first saw our guest today uh, talk about robots, there's two things that will strike you right away. One of them is, obviously, there's a an insane passion for robots. It says it on his shirt. It says it in the words that he speaks and the passion that he speaks about these devices. And and the second thing is that I look at it from, a, from an impact of mobile. Mobile is, I think, the facilitator to being able to get the first cheap robots into our houses. And I think that this is one of the most fascinating stories. I watched him at uh, an event uh, two, two times at an event in California in the past month. I've seen him speak on TED. I've seen him on CNN, on uh, in the Wall Street Journal, and now on Untether.tv. I'm joined today by Remotive co-founder Keller Renato. Keller, welcome, man. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. I'm happy to be here. Well, so I have seen you, uh, a lot of you, in the last little while, uh, and I'm so fascinated by this. But every time I bump into you, every time I see you on stage, every time I see you in the newspaper or in a magazine or on online, uh, I just want this machine. I want Romo in my house. I want to use it. So uh, um, congratulations so far on what you guys have done. I'm really impressed with this, and uh, certainly you guys must be happy to date. Um. <laughs> We're very busy building robots. I don't know if we really had the downtime to to think about you know how 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 lucky we are yet. But we're really busy. So right now we're we're very back ordered. Um, a lot of people have ordered robots and are waiting for their robots. So every day is sort of like a, a stressful battle to get out as many robots as we possibly can and, and get them into people's hands. How do you do that? I mean, we're going to get into this because I think that this is some great stories. As, as you, you'll see, many startups go through this process where it's like late nights, 24 hours a day, you're building you're building your product in, in a small, confined apartment. And I think that you, you guys fit that so well. And we'll, we'll get that story. But you got you got to explain, where did this fascination of robots come from? I mean, how long has this been fascinating? You have a, a we were just talking a second ago about the fact that you were rock climbing professionally before you, you got involved mm -hmm. in this. And But where does the love of robots come from? Um, I think it just, it comes from a love of science fiction. I, I, I grew up reading every kind of science fiction possible. I loved you know, Ender's Game and Star Trek. I read... I read every Star Trek book, which they were you know, the cheesiest novels ever, but um, you know, watching Star Trek, watching Star Wars, obsessed with science fiction. And I think that the coolest thing about science fiction is it's a prediction of the future. And in a lot of ways, a lot of the things that science fiction has predicted have come true. Um, but in our minds, especially when we were thinking about it a couple of years ago, robots are kind of the great unfulfilled promise of science fiction. Uh, Oh, for the for for a hundred years, science fiction has been predicting robots, and yet uh, very few people have robots in their home. And really, the only people who have access to robots that do cool things today, in our opinions, are working in academic labs or factories. Um, and so we just think that stinks. And uh, and you know, where are those robots that science fiction promised us when we were twelve years old? Twelve years old in front of the television, basically. And yeah, exactly, because they have a personality, and they're not just uh, basically assembly line workers, right? Which is what we're seeing in, in as robotics. Is that where we are right now? Is that, you know, for the most part, we don't have humanoids. We don't have anything that looks like us right now. And we've all seen these great videos of the dancing robots in Japan. And, you know, and we're always amazed by those things. But those are out of our price range and they're not going to be in everybody's home right now. Everybody talks about a, a robot in their house as the Romba or the, you know, the automatic vacuum cleaner, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what people think? So I think that right now in robotics generally, they're, uh, the state of robotics is that there are really cheap plastic robots that you can buy at Toys R Us for twenty or thirty or forty dollars, and whatever they do when you buy them is what they do when they break uh, a month later. They're single function and they're they're, they're disposable, toy. right? Yeah, they're disposable, right. um, and chances are they don't really have a personality. Uh, I, they just are basically meant to entertain for a short period of time, um, and then there are these multifunctional. Uh, tech showpieces that do do remarkable things like the PR2 or Osimo. 
Um, but these robots cost a million dollars or more. Uh, and so they're just fundamentally, I mean, when we were thinking about starting Remotive two years ago, we would have loved a PR2, uh, but we weren't rich, so we couldn't afford one. Um, and there's very little in between. There's this huge gap in robotics in terms of, in terms of a robot that is powerful enough to do a lot of the things that robots did in science fiction movies, but is affordable enough that you can actually imagine uh, a family buying one uh, and bringing it home and, and, and actually interacting with it. So um, we really think that the, the key to creating a, a revolution in robotics or, or, or kind of spurring innovation is, is going to be building a robot that is powerful enough to do cool stuff, um, but is fundamentally accessible to the hackers, to the kinds of people who would be writing software this thing for, for, for this kind of a robot on the weekends in their garages, or to you know, the 12-year-old versions of ourselves who would have loved building something like this for a robot uh, uh, you know, 14 years ago. So that's the vision. Like, basically, the case in robotics right now is there's nothing in the middle. We really want to build something in the middle, a robot that's powerful enough to do things that robots do in science fiction movies, but cheap enough that 12-year-old versions of ourselves would be able to buy it. Be able to save up and buy it. And, and, and like the, the whole story of this is that, uh, did you ever, uh, it's hard, it, what was the catalyst for this? Because, you know, there is a, uh, I mean, I look at this smartphone era as, as, you know, brains in my pocket. My wife always talks to me, is that, you know, uh, um, I always think that it's a deeper relationship that I have with my wife, but um, but I always tend to to be leaning over towards my phone whenever there's a question that needs to be answered, and and so it's my digital yeah. brain. Everything that I own, everything that I am, is in this thing. Um, so at some point, I've transferred my knowledge, whatever limited knowledge I have, I've given up on that, and I've now rely on this device, and it's and it is a powerful device. It's you know we we've all heard these statistics like 2,600 times uh, more intelligent than or more capable than the you know the computers that landed uh, Americans on the moon, right? And uh, right. so uh, you know there's got to be a moment where you're looking at this and you're like, my love of robots, my smartphone, my love of robots, my yes. smartphone. Yes. Wait. Yes. <laughs> what was what was it that that moved it and, and did this smartphone revolution did, did this portable brain portable computer world kind of inspire this yeah so we aren't the first people to have this goal of building something well, in then why am i interviewing a... you no i'm just joking yeah so so exactly so we're not the first person to think about this um lots of companies have tried to do this uh the problem is that processors are very expensive sensors are very expensive uh, Wi-Fi chips are very expensive. And when you add all of this stuff up, you, especially when you're not at scale, so ro most robotics companies aren't at scale, um, especially when you add all this hardware up, you're not at scale, you're a startup, you end up with a robot that's going to cost at least $50,000. And once the robot costs $50,000, you've lost the, the, the personal robotics market. And you have to start thinking, oh, man, can we sell this to a corporation or can we sell this to a factory? Um, so... That's the reason that even though lots of people have wanted to build something that you know, was in the middle of that market, that, that it hasn't happened. And so when we were looking at it, we're also Apple geeks. Uh, we love, you know, we love everything Apple. And it's exactly, it's exactly that. It was like, it really more started like a challenge. It was kind of like, gosh, you know, iPhones are so cool. Do you think that we could use this as a brain for a robot? Like just purely <laughs> speculation. speculation. Wouldn't that be cool if we could? do it. It'd be a fun thing. It'd be a fun project. And so it didn't really start as a, a bigger vision than that. It was more just like a challenge. Can we do it? Would people want it? Um, and so we built the first prototype and, uh, and the whole idea was basically by leveraging this device that is not only ubiquitous now, it's, it's almost extraneous. Lots of people have old iPhone 4s or old 4Ss or an old iPod Touch just sitting around. And so what are you going to do with those devices anyway? I mean, throw them out or sell them for a couple bucks online? Like, the more we thought about it, the more we thought it was actually pretty realistic that people might want to repurpose these devices in, in, into brains for these little robotic creatures that would, you know, wander around your house and, and, um, and interact with you and, and ultimately do useful things for you. Uh, so we ended up building the first prototype and, uh, you know, everybody that we talked to, especially investors, were like, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> I love that. Nobody's, nobody's going to buy it. Um, it's just a toy. I... You know, there's no killer use case. It's not very powerful. Nobody's going to want to put their phone on a robot. And do people really need personal robots anyway? And what was funny about that is that these were like really these were smart people. Like these were you know people who had sold companies to Google and um, and 
we heard that, and it's really definitely very discouraging. Uh, but actually, luckily, you know, a, a couple months later, we actually got to meet Steve Wozniak. He was in Vegas and had bought a robot. And uh, we told him that story, and he was like, oh, don't worry. That's exactly what they said about the personal computer. Uh, of course. Which is, like, it's just a toy. They're, what are the killer use cases? And you know, do people really need personal computers? It's too expensive at the time. It's all of those things that... Too yeah. expensive. Um, yeah, people aren't sure how they're going to use it. Um, one of the most interesting things, actually, is there's this poster that I've seen of, uh, of I, I think it's advertising the, uh, the Apple II. And it says, it's a picture of the computer, and then it says... Um, or maybe it's, yeah, I think it's the Apple II. It says, uh, it says the personal slash home computer, <laughs> which is crazy because the reason they did that is that they weren't sure that the personal computer was a good off. idea. Yeah. <laughs> they weren't sure that was going to take off. So they were also kind of like selling it as like a home computer that you'd put recipes on. Maybe that was the killer use case. We want to make sure um, that it's, that th we're telling them that it's a computer, but we don't want to dictate the use case for this at this point. That's right. That's well, right. And, and, and no one knew that personal computer was a good idea, even, even at that point. So, so we think that something really similar is happening in, in, um, in robotics. And, and that was what was so compelling to us. So basically, we, we built that first prototype, and we ended up um, you know, putting it on Kickstarter. And when we put it on Kickstarter, it ended up becoming one of the most successful hardware projects um, uh, at the time. And uh, that showed us in no uncertain way that we weren't the only nerds on the block. There were lots of other nerds who thought this idea of having a robot that would use your smartphone as its brain was actually really cool, and they were willing to pay, you know, a hundred or one hundred and fifty bucks uh, for the opportunity to have that robot in their home. So, going back to this, like when you guys started this company a couple of years ago, um, there's three of you guys that, that co-founded it. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And right, and me and, and Peter and Fu. Okay, so uh, you, Peter, and Fu. Um, are, are, are said like, there, there's got to be something here. You at the time are a professional rock climber is that what yeah. so it caught me off guard when we were talking about this before we started recording is that so you're climbing rocks professionally yeah. which is a very unique <laughs> trade right but not nearly as glamorous as you might well, have no, I, well, I mean you know what uh, but uh, like there's a gap here that i'm trying to trying to reconcile which is between rock climbing and building robots so, yeah. like, uh, obviously, we're all inspired by by science, science fiction, as as you are as well. Um, and uh, so, you're climbing rocks. Uh, your partners decide to what? Submit to TechStars, I think, is what is that is, is the way yeah. that this works. Now, is this before this is before Kickstarter or after Kickstarter? It was it was before. Okay, so you decide that you're going to submit yourself to TechStars, um, and and um, you get accepted. So it was actually a little more. It's actually even a little more complicated than that. So I've known I've known Peter and Fu. We we um, built computers together in in middle school and high school. I've known them forever, basically. Um, we grew up together, and uh, and so we we were always kind of like talking about cool stuff and and technology that we were seeing. And uh, and it was actually Fu who kind of said, God, "Do you think that we could create a you know robot with the a phone as its brain?" And then Peter was like, "Well, I'll breadboard a circuit." And so Peter <laughs> built something, and then they showed me, and I was like, "That's really cool." But you know, we need to like figure out what the hell it does. Um, and so we were kind of all talking, and and I, uh, and yeah, we we decided to apply. Across the country, uh, climbing, and so uh, Peter and Fu went to TechStars Seattle, and I I actually showed up uh, a couple weeks uh, before Demo Day to to. Um, to kind of like start working full time. So they, they went through the whole process and you showed up a couple of weeks before demo day. And then, um, mm -hmm. and then, so you graduate from TechStars. Now TechStars is, is very well known to, to kind of put comp their companies in, in front of some serious investors, right? Um, mm -hmm. So did they do that for you? And, and when they did, if they did, uh, first, did they do that for you guys? Did you, you pitched yeah, I mean, everybody, right? When we were in Techstars Seattle, we went, went through Demo Day and we got to speak to a whole bunch of angel investors in Seattle as well as a bunch of VCs. Was there any, was there any interest at that point? Um, only from, only from the, the craziest people in the audience, I would say. <laughs> I think that um, especially, I, I think, especially actually, people say that you know, Silicon Valley doesn't favor hardware, but I actually think that places other than Silicon Valley really don't favor right. hardware because I think that um, a lot of those places are looking and trying to learn from Silicon Valley and kind of like taking trends from the last 10 years. Um, I mean, as an example, uh, one of our, so our very first investor is a guy named Bharat. Um, and uh, Bharat 
gave me a call the next day and he was like, yeah, I was there with a group of angel investors and they all thought that this was a completely crazy idea and it didn't make any sense, but I'd, I'd love to, to meet you guys. Um, and so he came in and, and he actually called me when he was on his way in and he was like, can I bring my son, Sam? And Sam's eight years old. Perfect. Uh, and we were like, definitely bring Sam. <laughs> and, uh, and so he can't, he comes and he brings Sam, who's this precocious, uh, or maybe he may have been seven at the time. Um, he, he brings his precocious son. And so we have a robot ready for Sam. And so we just hand Sam an iPad and put the robot outside. And a bunch of the other tech stars teams are like, you know, like abducting Sam's robot and like taking him into pl strange places. He doesn't know. And kind of like playing with him via the robot. And he's sitting right next to his dad in this conference room with us, just playing on, on the robot that he can't see because it's outside. And we're like trying to have a conversation with Barat, but it's just totally hopeless because it's completely interrupted like over and over. Just com it's like the most disruptive thing we could have done to a conversation to give Sam um, the robot. But, uh, you know, Sam's just going nuts. Like, like, Dad, look at this. Dad, look at that. Like, how do I do this? How do I do that? And constantly asking questions. And he's just a really curious kid. And, uh, and at the end of the conversation, Barat was like, you know, guys, <laughs> he's like, separate from our conversation, you guys could have been speaking Klingon. If I see Sam react like this to something, I'm going to invest in it. Um, That's amazing. And Barat, yeah, and, and Barat at that time, he actually, when he, when he, he you know, when he, when he was uh, transferring the money, he was like, guys, just so you know, I'm marking this as a zero in my checkbook. You're, at the time, we were, we were 25, 25, and 21. He was like, you guys are young. I, I basically assume that this money is lost. I don't expect a return from it. What I do ask is that you guys swing for the fences and, and don't compromise. Because uh, I think this is a really big idea. And that actually was such a cool thing to hear, <laughs> like when you're starting your first company and, and raising money. And that's actually been the template for the kind of investor that we've looked for ever since then um, at, at Remotive. We're looking for people who are, I mean, because honestly, if you were looking for a quick return or, or a quick turn on your money, investing in a robotics company is a really bad idea. Yeah. Um, but we absolutely think that robotics is the future. I mean, I think, I really think that predicting the future is just go read science fiction. Um, but Elon already has spaceships and electric cars covered, so we figured we'd take robots. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's a big idea, and that's the kinds, of, like, the kinds of investors we tend to attract. I think they tend to be nerds. They tend to be people who grew up watching Star Wars, um, and they tend to be people who, who are willing to, to, to invest in a company that, that uh, you know, wants to actually have it, like, make a dent in the universe. We're certainly we're not like the next you know, Instagram for pets. No, no, no. I, you know, it's, what, a, what a great strategy. You know, uh, bring a seven-year-old to go and take a, a test drive of a, of a robot, right? Uh, you, you know that you're going to yeah. win them over. Because I have seen you in a room win over 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds, 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 20-year-olds. I've seen you just basically uh, sell just by letting people use it. And, and, and um, yeah. Yeah, it's not me. It's Romo. Well, it's Romo. And, and by the way, here's here's Romo. I love <laughs> it's it's Romo sells himself. It makes it makes our job very easy. Um, but he's he's complicated. Yeah. This this little Romo is a complicated piece of machinery. So I and, and I do want to talk about that. But I want to finish off the story here around this. So you, so you 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 uh, it just seems to me that that uh, people aren't aren't ready for this as an investment, right? Simply because it is a hardware play. It, it is a, uh, it's not a novelty thing, but it, it's an entry level robot into your house that's going to cost $150. It's hardware, it's sales, it's tough, right? It's, it's a, you know, you got to manufacture and we'll talk about that in a second. So, yeah. you know, and, and, and this is two years ago and people are very interested in finding Facebooks and finding Instagrams and finding uh, LinkedIn's and finding Foursquares at the time. And, and you guys walk up with this chassis that looks like a tank and a, uh, and right. a you know, a, a, <laughs> smartphone. a smartphone and say, this is a robot, right? <laughs> right? And people look at you square. And I think that it's very interesting that Techstars brought you in there. Now, yeah. so then you jump onto Kickstarter. You raise what the first time around you raised one hundred fourteen thousand dollars, right? Yep. Totally subscribed yep. in a month. Is that right? Yep. Th Thirty yeah, days, one hundred fourteen thousand dollars. So now you've got the commitment factor as well, right? So you've got you've got people who have put money down. This isn't an investment. This is actually prepaying for product ultimately. And now now you gotta now you gotta commit. Now you now you guys have committed and you're building these robots. Uh, yep. What was that like to 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 get that kind of reception? Um, you know, at the time, uh, raising that money, I mean, we had a goal of raising $32,000 and we thought 
if we could raise that much money, we would be set. Um, well, Kelly, when we ended up raising, what would you have done with thirty two thousand dollars? In retrospect, nothing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I wouldn't have gotten us anywhere. <laughs> Um, but you know, when you're starting your first company, that seems like a lot of money. And, uh, and how much do you think you should have asked for? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, you know, we could have asked for a hundred thousand, looking back, we could have asked for a hundred thousand dollars and, uh, and we would have still raised that much money. But I think that, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a, it was an eye-opening moment, basically realizing that wow, you know, this could be a business. There are a thousand people who just who we don't know from all over the world who just told us that they would buy this robot. And by the way, the first robot was really rough. It was you know, it was a, basically a prototype. It was laser cut out of acrylic, and um, it was a circuit board that was designed by us. Um, you know, I mean, Peter at first was breadboarding every single circuit board and then hand soldering it together. I mean, it was like it was really. Um, from scratch, and uh, and so I don't know what we would have done with thirty two thousand, but one hundred seventeen thousand. Interestingly, I mean, I think, and I actually think this is true for most Kickstarters. You, I think, most people on their first go on Kickstarter make two mistakes. One is that they think that the money they're raising is investment, yeah. which it isn't. As you mentioned, it's a pre order, and that that money comes with a deliverable, which is basically you have to deliver hardware to this person in, in some amount of time. Um, and B, the other mistake that people make, which makes the first mistake even worse is that they underprice. So, cause you, you're like, Oh, I just really want to sell a lot of them. So they tend to underprice. They'll sell it like at, at what they think is cost. Um, but of course cost is always way more than you think it's going to be. And so, um, so we definitely made both of those mistakes early on. We raised $117,000, but it cost us at least $150,000 to, to build those robots and deliver them. So I, uh, we were very lucky in, 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 in terms of being able to, you know, bring in these outside investors like Barat, were people who just really believed in the vision, and they were like, "You're absolutely right. Where are the robots? This this is going to be like the, the personal robotics market is huge, um, and it's just a matter of someone figuring out um, the entry point." And so, and and so, we were very lucky to have those those guys because had had we not, the Kickstarter would have bankrupted us. <laughs> It's just, but uh, you know, so people look at it as a success because it's heralded as a success. You were oversubscribed. Thirty-two thousand was the ask. One hundred and fourteen thousand was the give, yeah. and uh, and it's like, oh my god, this is what a what a rollout. What is what a total success. But you're right. Without Barat, I mean, bankruptcy happens as a yep. result of your success. <laughs> yeah, like it, that. <laughs> totally. That's sad. And, and uh, I love the question though. It's like, uh, hey, yeah, where are all the robots? Like, right. I mean, you're not asking the right question out there if you aren't asking that question, right? It's like, right. it's not like uh, you, you don't notice them. It's just, no, where are they? And so in all your businesses, if you're listening to this, it's just like, you got to ask that. It's like, where are all the self-driving cars, says Google, you know? Exactly. That, that's it. And there are things, and I, and I think it's actually funny because, uh, you know, the U.S. and Canada are some of the least imaginative <laughs> countries in terms of robotics. Yes. I, I hate to say it, but it's true. Well, um, I think that I think it, it it might be like a kind of a backlash from Star Wars or Star Trek, which is that like we all grew up like convinced that these robots were going to make our lives awesome, and it just hasn't happened. And I feel like everybody is very disappointed, and people are oh robots like. But if you actually go to places like France or Japan, I mean, robots are a much bigger part of the culture, and people are much more interested in them, and, and much bigger believers in their potential. But the potential for robots to do things like eventually um, to be able to, uh, you know babysit kids and train pets and be a security guard for your house and um, you know we, you ought to be able to be walking around and and <clears throat> you, you ought to be able to for example be on a business trip and just like log into a robot via google glass and drive it from room to room to say goodnight to your kids like these are obvious use cases um, but people don't think about them because i think that generally we're really disillusioned about robots and we think that it's just technologically impossible it's, ne it's never gonna happen. i'm never gonna have an extra million dollars to get something that looks like this which is a humanoid and what we find i mean what i find in north america anyways is that we focus on on the most inane things like um you know internet connected refrigerators this meme that won't go away right and 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 yeah. uh you're right is that the, maybe the innovation uh, we we are um spoiled because we see it on the screens uh, all the time but but you're right i mean i'm looking around i don't see a robot in my house right and and yeah. and i don't see a robot anywhere except for that stupid little vacuum cleaner and and that's not a robot so we you know we won't we won't talk about that <laughs> i mean i i i think that 
Um, you know, technically it might be a robot. It's a single function yeah. robot, though. And and there um, are some and, of those, and, right? Yeah. Yep. I mean, Wally was a robot. He had multi, but he started as a single function robot, right? He anyway. Yeah, but but it's <laughs> but Wally had a great personality, and actually, Romo is is partly based on Wally and partly based on Eve. We we watched Wally many times when we were designing this robot. My, my kids are six, and I think I've seen that movie one thousand times. One of their favorite <laughs> movies of all time, but. But it shows the imagination is there and it, and it happens like this. And the kids kind of, I don't know what happens between six years old and 16, where you kind of realize that, that Wally will never exist. And I think Romo may, might yeah. be that first thing. So, okay, 114,000 in, you've got Barad as an investor, you're cranking out these prototypes. Um, what was the reaction when you started shipping these things? Um, you know, the, the, I, the reaction was... <laughs> I mean, uh, it was it was crazy when we were so when we were initially designing those robots, we uh, we were literally building them in our apartment every day. We would build a hundred robots and then put them in IKEA bags, and we actually we had to ship actually a hundred by Christmas. And for those robots, we barely made it. We had fab circuit boards in in uh, China, and then we had assembled components onto them in Seattle, and then shipped them to Vegas, where um, Fu and Peter and I had an apartment because. Uh, Tony Shea had just given us this apartment to uh, to build robots in, and uh, we we were trying to build these 100 robots, and the circuit boards weren't working. I mean, we got after like two months of waiting, got circuit boards got here. We were trying to get a digital circuit board working, and it was just dead, like not working. And it's like we had promised these 100 robots by Christmas, and it was just devastating that we weren't going to be able to meet that. And so we ended up staying up like four. Four nights in a row or something. We were like watching like James Bond marathons while everybody's like you know soldering and like twisting wires and trying to get these things to work. Um, and I remember I had like gone to sleep for four hours and then on like December twenty second at like seven a.m. Peter had still staying up was like, hey guys, I you know figured it out. We can just hack the circuit board and use it as an analog circuit as opposed to a digital circuit. Which is by the way like it's like buying a Ferrari and then using it as a than like cutting out everything and just using it as a bicycle. Like it's crazy. You know, we had the circuit board was designed to be do something much more complex than this, but he was like, let's just use it as an analog circuit. It'll work. We can send it to all of our backers. And so we like woke up at 7 a.m., went, assembled all 100 robots. We put candy canes uh, on top uh, of the robot in the box because we were like, we don't know if it's going to work. So if it doesn't work, at the very least, people will have candy canes and, uh, and sent them out. And, uh, and then remarkably, I, uh, you know, the robots did work, and people had them under their trees in time for Christmas, and and uh, we met that first that first order that we had promised on Kickstarter. Which, at the time, it felt like you know I'm sure it wouldn't have been, but at the time, it felt like that the the survival of the company was hanging in the balance. That 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 first experience. Um... I mean, obviously, you you feel very compelled. That that's the, the I think the 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 part that a lot of people don't see about Kickstarter is that delivery part, as we were saying. Yeah. Yeah. So you are you are quite literally assembling this in a room, and and while you're going through this these four days, and you're you're you know, even leading up to the assembling this, did you ever think ah, this is not a good idea? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> no, I, you don't really have time to question. <laughs> You just do. I mean, we we didn't. We were. I was more just worried. Like, are these robots going to work? Um, and you know, and and once we have these 100 done, by the way, we have to build you know another 1500. So how is that going to work? Um, so how does that go over with you guys? Like when you when you're kind of something's got to change here. Obviously, right at at that point, you're like, uh, you know, this is this is not a way that we can we can build a business. Nobody's going to invest in us. We're not going to be able to do this. Like I, I ran a cheesecake. I mean, I made cheesecakes mm. for restaurants, right? <laughs> yeah, I was seventeen or eighteen, mm -hmm. and I was in the in the restaurant business, and I and I'm and I I started selling cheesecakes. It's the only thing I could really do in life, which was make cheesecakes, right? I don't know mm. why. Um, you don't ask the gifts that are given to you. Uh, that was <laughs> that was mine. Yeah. But I would I would work all day in the restaurants, and I had two jobs. I work all day in the restaurant, and then I'd work all night in the restaurant, and then I would go home overnight, and I would cook cheesecakes, and then I would get up in the morning, and I would I, they'd set overnight, and then I'd deliver them to you know the four or five restaurants that that I have to deliver them to, and then I'd go work all day and all night, and and you kind of come to a realization that it's not sustainable, and you know yeah. the thirty dollars or thirty five dollars I was getting per cheesecake was not worth the effort that was going into it. So you right. kind of realize that it's not sustainable. So was, was as you're sitting there building Ro Romos, 
was it kind of like that cheesecake experience with me where it's like, no, 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 can't do it. I need a bakery. I need a, I, I need a, uh, I need a chef. I need somebody who's going to cook. I need something that's going to help this. Yeah. No, I mean, it was definitely when we were doing it, it definitely, it was very clear that this was not going to scale. Yeah. I mean, there are pictures, I'm sure if you want to pull one up for this interview that we, we've published them, but the pictures of that apartment, I mean, sleeping, we on, like sleeping, sleeping on air mattresses, on air yeah. mattresses. Yeah. And like, I was, yeah, we had like, you know, the, 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 there was this archway to, that you had to go through of the bathroom and it was formed out of these USPS boxes, like thousands of them that we had actually like opened up and assembled or, or you know, uh, taped together and put in the uh, master bedroom where I was sleeping. And then, um, you know, we were like just boxes of robotics components everywhere and like walking the robots to the post office every single day. It was very obvious to us that we weren't going to scale much past like 100 robots a day there. Um, but we ended up hiring a couple people who we found here in, uh, in Vegas uh, to come and start working building robots for us. And that was, I'm sure, in retrospect, a very funny Craigslist ad. It was like $8 an hour, come build robots with us in our apartment. Um, but we actually ended up finding someone named James who uh, has just been one of like the core cultural members of the team. He was a um, he was like an undefeated UFC fighter here in uh, here in Vegas, and he was going to school um, yeah, uh, studying computer engineering. And uh, he came in and interviewed with us, and we we're like, "Eight bucks an hour, you're hired, man. Come build. Do you know how to solder?" And he's like, "Yeah, I know how to solder." We we're like, "All right, come on up." And we just literally walked up to the apartment with him and like. Um, put him to work and and you know two years later james is still here and now he's running like all of distribution uh for remote so so <laughs> you know it, it, there's so many visuals and we can go down that track and and uh, you know i think that that's an important piece is that uh like you guys have been have been working with romo are you sick of him yet uh, by any chance like the, like the, the moments where you're like oh just stop looking at me romo um you know it's funny the thing with the thing so uh, a couple of things i First of all, building hardware sucks. <laughs> if you're thinking about building hardware, it sucks. So don't say that I didn't tell you. Um, it's hard. Like you have to see around corners. Everything's more expensive. Whereas with software, if you make a mistake, you really know immediately and you can fix it immediately. With hardware, you make a mistake. You might not know until you've shipped like 3,000 units into, someone, in, into people's homes. And then the mistake becomes clear. You're like, okay, how are we going to deal with this? Um, so you basically have to see around corners. You have to predict the future, and you have to exist in this state of paranoia, which is like, okay, it's working now, but what about in six months? Is it still going to be working? Is it still robust? You know, if people are slamming it, you know, launching it off tables and knocking it against walls, is it still going to work? Um, so hardware sucks. And the other thing is that, especially I think when you're starting a company and you're young, uh, we the only frustrating thing about looking at Romo is us knowing that. There's so much more that he could do. And when we look at something like Roma, we're like, okay, you know, speech recognition. This robot ought to be able to you know, hear my voice and know exactly what I'm saying and respond accordingly. Um, autonomous navigation using visual data. This robot ought to be able to drive around my house without bumping into things. He ought to be able to recognize different faces. Uh, he ought to be able to do smile and frown detection so that he can use the visual uh, image of my, he can basically look at the, an image of my face and know how I'm feeling and respond uh, accordingly. I, uh, you know, this you ought to be able to log into this robot via Google Glass and stream two-way audio and video. There are like so many things that we look at Roman and we're like, that's what he we we he should do these things. It's hard because when you're just getting started, you're building the minimum viable product and it doesn't do any of those things. And so in our minds, you know, we look at it and we're like, it's just one percent. You know, it's not nearly there in terms of being this what we ultimately are striving to do, which is build the world's first, like truly. Uh, affordable personal robot that would just be multifunctional and you just would ask it to do something and, and it would do it for you. So that's actually what's hard. I think it's, I think it's when you're starting a company and, and you have this big vision, I, I think a lot of times you have no idea how to achieve that vision. And, and it's kind of a process of being willing to build something that isn't there yet. It's, you have to just, you know, you have to, you have to understand how to like, okay, well, you have to build the 1% and then the 2% and then the 3% before you get the hundred percent. And that's, what's frustrating. Well, I think that, I, I mean, that's, that's the business. You're democratizing robots ultimately is what yeah. it ends up being. So, I mean, and, yeah. and you have to put a, you have to put a cap on it because at some point that $150, you, you know, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, at, at a point you're like, 
well, $150, we can't do it anymore, right? So now it's going to be a $200 and a $250. And I think that's what you're trying to avoid is that escalation of price. You're looking at decreasing the price. So there are, there's are there got to be some trade-offs between functions, features, um, size, scope, so that it remains at that entry-level uh, robotic or entry-level robot, which I, I find funny to say, right? You'd actually, I think you'd, you'd be kind of, you'd be surprised. I actually think there are fewer trade-offs in terms of hardware and functionality than people think. Um, it is definitely true that some kinds of functionality are just going to require more expensive mm -hmm. hardware. If you want a robot that will pick up your clothes and like clean your room for you when you're gone. Please? <laughs> yeah, it's coming, but, um, but you would need an actuator and that's going to be a lot more expensive. Like, so there are some trade-offs, but in general... Uh, with something like Romo, you can actually do a lot of extraordinary things all from the software side. Yeah. And when you're and when you're building additional software functionality, that doesn't necessarily add to the bomb cost of the robot. Right. So it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to increase the cost of the robot to the end user. Right. So we actually think that over the next couple of years, we can continue all those things I actually mentioned. Are, those are all done from software, yeah. and they can all be done with the current hardware of Romo, which costs 150 bucks. That's amazing. Um, so. So it's not so much a, a trade-off between hardware, it's just it's a trade-off actually of time and figuring out like we have limited time and where are we going to invest it in terms of building out the things that we think are really killer use cases for Romo. Um, the second thing is you know, the coolest thing, one of the coolest things about Romo is that because he's using a smartphone, we actually have access to the App Store. What that means is that you can constantly download new behaviors for your robot over time, and the robots are also all Wi-Fi connected so that they learn from each other. So if one person creates a behavior for one robot, robot all the other robots can leverage that behavior and learn it. Um, and so our time is limited, but you know, we have an SDK so that anybody out there who, I mean, we actually have lots of different ways of programming the robot. We have uh, the simplest possible way, which is uh, you know, an eight-year-old can instantly and intuitively create a behavior or personality for the robot just using this visual programming language on the device itself. And then all the way on the other end of things, we have an SDK so that any experienced uh, engineer can actually build their own apps for Romo and share that with everybody else who owns robots in the wild. And so the whole goal of that is like we don't have enough time to build all of these cool functionalities that we think are possible. So we want to put that power into other people's hands, um, let them build software for Romo as well, and, and let the the apps that are most popular um, kind of surface and, and, and all the robots can leverage those apps. How, how do you decide what what features or, or what Romo will do? Like, uh, I mean, is it just, it's got to start at some point with you guys saying, wouldn't it be cool if, as you did, right? Wouldn't it be cool if, wouldn't it be yeah. cool if? But now, so how many are in production? You've got 5,000 that have been, that have been uh, are in, you've got 5,000 robots roaming the land right now? Um, in the wild yeah. right now, of, of this version, of the latest yeah. version of Romo, we currently have, uh, I think we, we uh, as of this week, we'll have like 2,200 robots. Okay. Um, and then we'll, we're shipping another 2,800 robots in the next month. Um, and then we'll be shipping another 10,000 robots uh, later this summer. So it's, it's scaling rapidly. That's pretty quick. Uh, so, yeah, but, uh, scary. like obviously people, uh, people are, are telling you what they'd like. So how do you... You've got the SDK, and you've got you know, let developers do their own thing. But how do you guys decide what goes in and what doesn't go into Romo? It's really hard. That's one of the hardest, that's one of the hardest things that we do. Um, do you fight about it? Do you, do you guys do, you, do oh, the three three of you definitely. guys sit down and, and duke it out, or do you bring investors in? Twenty of us. Twenty of us. 20. Everybody who we've hired at Remoto has an opinion. Um, has an opinion and a good one uh, because we all care about it a lot. If we didn't care about <laughs> robots, there's no way we would put in the hours or, or deal with the hassle. Yeah. But um, so we all do. We all talk about it a lot, trying to figure out what what do we think. And what do we think is the long term, uh, uh, you know, the most viable use cases, and also the use cases that are going to be easiest to hit right now, as opposed to in a year from now. Um, it depends. I think right now it's it's a question of like, what do we think are the use cases that are simplest? Actually, that's a big one for us because you mentioned Romo is a really complicated device. It's true; he's really complicated to build. Uh, but at the same time, we wanted to build something that was insanely simple to use, like insanely simple. So literally, when you get Romo, you just uh, here, I'll I'll pull the box off. So you just literally, you know, here's the robot sitting inside. So I literally just take the robot out of the box, and then pull my phone out of my pocket, and plug my phone into Romo, uh, and it automatically downloads the software you need. He instantly wakes up. He's an intelligent creature, like following your face and uh, and doing things like that. So 
So anyway, uh, we, we basically are uh, really focused on the use cases that we think are super simple. Like what, what's something that people can instantly understand? Um, and, uh, and then also just what are things that are, that are easy enough to use that we think that actually like 100% of our user base is actually going to benefit from them. So have you had, uh, I mean, are there features that, that you thought, listen, these are, these are definitely going to fit in that you've had to pull or that, that, uh, that, you know, kind of however you do it, democratically or otherwise that you just say no you know we, we can't afford to build this in it but we you know that have made it into the second version um you know one example of something that we thought we were going to do early on that we decided not to do was augmented reality hmm. um we, we were, when we were initially thinking we were like oh we'd be an awesome gaming platform for augmented reality and, and we should build that um at the same time you know there are these the, there are the, these other things we want to do like we we're like Romo would be an amazing pet slash friend he um, he's intelligent. He can exhibit these cool autonomous behaviors. He uses computer vision using the video camera on the phone to kind of analyze the world around him um, and react accordingly. Uh, and then we were also obviously thinking, you know, this also needs to be a robot that anybody can program, and it'd be an awesome way of getting kids excited about computer science. Um, of those three, we've actually focused on the last two, the augmented reality uh, and gaming. We actually decided that that's not what Romo is going to be good at. Um, and also that that's not there's not like a true need for that. We think that uh, apps, you know, for ninety nine cents, it's really easy to download an, an, an app that is like an insanely entertaining. We're not so much interested in building robots that will just entertain. We'd rather build robots that um, that are a manifestation of people's imaginations. And that was the reason that we ended up focusing much more on this idea of, you know, Romo's a, a personality and a creature that you can train over time. And basically, in training him, uh, you know, depending on the level of training that you want to do, you, you're going to learn computer science as you go because you start learning about if you know if clauses and um, and for loops and uh, and just slowly figuring out how to build these simple programs for Romo where it's totally motivated, you know, because you're like, okay, I just want to figure out how to get the robot to go from my kitchen to the living room, uh, you know, to to alert me that dinner's ready or whatever it is, but I. But the whole that that's what we were mainly focused on. It was it was trying to figure out a way of um, of turning him into an intelligent creature and uh, allowing anybody to program him. So those are the two things that we're currently focused on for Romo, and uh, it's hard because there are like a hundred other things that we could do as well. Romo also does telepresence, but we don't actually talk about it that much because it's hard for people to understand, which is crazy. But with robots in general, it sucks because there's no one we can copy. <laughs> Uh, there's no like marketing campaign for robots. We're like, oh, that was a great marketing campaign for a robot. Let's do that, you know. Um, so it's really more like we're we're learning stuff from scratch. And and telepresence is an especially hard one because it's actually one of the coolest things that Romo does, which he streams two way audio and video between any from from you know the device on the robot to any iPad, iPhone, uh, com uh, computer running Chrome. Uh, so he, he streams two way audio and video, but. Uh, it's just hard to, and, and what that means is he's basically Skype on wheels. Right. So you can use Romo to like log in, babysit kids. You can invite grandma to hang out for Thanksgiving dinner if she can't make it and she lives on the other side of the country. Or you know, grandma can log in and play hide and go seek with her granddaughter for 15 minutes every single night. There are a lot of really cool use cases there. Um, but it's just weird enough that it's kind of hard to describe. So that's actually a, a feature that we provide to all of our users, but we don't really talk about it that much because... There are simpler things that we can describe that that are just as compelling. We've alluded to uh, Eve. We've alluded to uh, Wally as influence on Romo, the software. And great software yeah. needs great UI, great UX. It's almost like you you as you said, it's intuitive. You put it in, you use it. Um, right. How hard was it to develop Romo? How hard was it to develop the software? Um, and and it, you guys are both a hardware and a software company. Is that hard to manage? So start with the software. Yeah. Um, so. You know, the, the, doing both is hard, um, and that's actually why uh, I think starting a robotics company is a lot harder than starting a, a, any other kind of company. It's because you know, if you're starting, if you're starting just a, a mobile company, it's you get to be good at one thing. You're like, okay, we're going to hire iOS engineers, or we're going to hire Android engineers, and that's you know, that's what most companies are going to look like. And then we're going to obviously have to figure out marketing, but that's it. Um, but when you're starting a robotics company, you're like, okay, we have to be great at mechanical engineering, firmware, uh, electrical engineering, industrial design, uh, you know, and then all of the software disciplines like computer vision, speech recognition, um, 
iOS development, uh, and then obviously manufacturing, distribution, supply chain. Um, so you just have to be good across a whole bunch of different uh, disciplines, and uh, or you have to be great across a whole bunch of different disciplines, and, and that's hard uh, because we end up at a team of 20, we, we have a lot of single points of failure. And I think that leads to, it just makes things more stressful because it's like one person is doing everything. It's like if, we, if that person didn't work at remote, we would be dead in the water. Um, and so that does make it harder. Um, but it is definitely true. I mean, the advantage for us is that because we have such a powerful processor in the, phone, in the form of an iPhone that we get basically for free. We don't have to charge our users for that processor. Um, we can do a lot of really magical things on the software side. What would you and you know? So what, what, sorry, what would ahead. you have done differently? Like you know, in hindsight, I always love asking this question. Cause it's easy to ask, um, but uh, in hindsight, um, knowing what you know two years in, knowing knowing that you know you're the ones that are soldering the boards and doing the software at the same mm -hmm. time and shipping and all that kind of stuff. Uh, w I'm not going to ask if you would do the same thing over again, but would you would you have started with a like a um, like a robot on the device, just software, and then and then added hardware? Is there is there a different sequence you would have used, or is this the way that you would do it again? A couple of things. I think um, one was that early on we chose to support both Android and and iOS, and that was a mistake. Um, it's really hard to develop for either one, let alone both. Yeah. And developing for both is at least doubling your work, if not more. Um, and so as we were kind of searching around for the right product fit, it was a mistake to be trying to support both markets at once just because a lot of what we were building was irrelevant anyway. And so it makes a lot more sense to focus on one market, get it right, and then transfer. And that's actually, uh, that's another, uh, I mean, that's what we did with the second version of the robot. This robot is iOS only. Mm -hmm. And while we do plan to support Android in the future, we just wanted to make sure that we got one product right, like got a product right and made it incredibly simple to use and robust um, for the iOS platform before we moved to the Android platform. So that was one mistake. Another mistake is um, I think early on we underestimated how hard it is to actually get something into, um, in, in, into a full production with a contract manufacturer. Um, we thought, oh, this is something we can do in three months. And I think that's actually what most people who post kick hardware projects on Kickstarter think. And it is just, it's so hard. Like we've had every advantage, every resource. We've taken every precaution, basically. Like my co-founder has been living in China for the last six months. Uh, several of our, of, of our um, engineers have been living there. And uh, still it feels like we're just barely, barely getting by, um, you know, with the quality standards that we, that we have, which are pretty strict. Like we need to know that these robots are gonna operate perfectly when they get shipped to our users. <clears throat> And so that's been an incredible challenge. And I think, uh, you know, looking back, I wish that we had um, emphasized design for manufacturability earlier on, uh, just because that is such an important component. Just because you can build N of one does not mean that you can reliably build N of 10,000. Um, so that's been a really important lesson that we've kind of learned the hard way and, uh, and we're now taking into account, but it's I, I wish we had known that earlier but it's so uh, like you know i almost believe that y you as an entrepreneur uh you as a small business you as the guys that are that are changing the way things are done i mean you're not building you know uh, a foam hammer that makes a noise when you hit you know you hit the ground right i mean what you're building is is a complicated chassis that houses specific things that has to interact with the software yeah. i mean um because if it was easy everybody would be doing it so it's almost like you have to go through that experience of of assembling them and going through the pain so that you you know your partner can your co-founder can go yeah. to china and make sure that the assembly is done perfectly right like uh, yeah. uh, you know if you'd relied on on outsourced assembly this whole time uh you know maybe the quality wouldn't have been as good it wouldn't have been as unique it wouldn't have had the the remote of stamp on it right um so yeah, I think I think that's absolutely true. I mean, we're not comfortable not owning any part of it. But uh, it's hard for me to imagine. I think that that's a big part of why Remotive. I think that's a big part of why Romo is so magical as a product. It's that when you look at him, you know that this is like created by a team of people who really cared about him. I, I, I do fundamentally believe that when you look at a product, you can tell if that product was created by like a whole bunch of focus groups and a whole bunch yes. of you know, nine to fivers who just didn't give like a, a Furby didn't give a damn. 
Yeah, I mean, no, trust I me. Want I, to pass I, judgment, but... We've got two of them here, and uh, if yeah. if I literally could murder the two Furbies with, and get away with it, I, I would. You know, they yeah, always are found. Whenever I put them in a dark closet, whenever the batteries run out, it's always like they come back to it, and it. Uh, and much rather than have a Romo, and you know, part of part of the appeal for me for Romo is, is uh, from a kid's standpoint, is yeah. is this. Uh, would you consider it a programming language or a, a personality language that you guys have built inside of Romo? Um, yeah. Describe that and, and why do that? So uh, for us, I mean, one thing is that we um, we really believe that kids have to learn to, to, to program. Um, and the current educational system is doing a terrible job of doing that. Um, and we also think that today, you know, the way that we try to teach most kids or get most kids excited about computer science is that we like have them typing stuff into a text editor and then executing code and seeing a result. It's like, is that really going to be that interesting to, you know, a, an eight or 10 or 12 year old boy or girl? Um, we think it's a lot more natural to teach kids about computer science using robots because robots are the intersection between code and the real world. So if you actually want to code things in the real world, like you want to say, hey, go pick up that ball or go interact with that person or go to that place. Um, these are just way more motivating problems. Like, hey, let's figure out how to get the robot to go from the kitchen to the living room where it can, you know, find your brother and make a face. Like, these are just problems that kids understand. <laughs> and, and I think it's a lot easier to motivate learning about technology and computer science and robotics if you're willing to put stuff into kids' hands and, and let them learn. Um, the other thing is that, you know, in general, we think that personal robotics is going to be the most important thing in terms of making personal robotics um, viable over the next 10 years is figuring out a way of making robots multifunctional to the degree that whatever you want your robot to do, it's very simple to program the robot to do that. And you don't, you, sh you, you should not have to be a software engineer to tell your robot what to do. So we're really, really um, you know, passionate about this idea of, uh, of providing a lot of different levels of programming. And the simplest one is that is, is, it's in the app currently. You can basically just set up these if thens. And so in like 20 seconds, you can create a personality for Romo. So you can create a scared Romo or a happy Romo or a, an angry Romo or a Romo that will wander around and look for faces. When he sees a face, he'll warn you and then take a picture, something like that. Um, you should be able to create these simple behaviors. And, and we've actually over the last couple of weeks been going and teaching and uh, teaching robotics to, I think we've taught like a thousand kids between the ages of, I mean, it's a lot. I think we're doing, I think we're doing 300 a day or something. So it's a lot. Uh, but uh, we've been going and teaching these classes to just sort of see kids using Romo. And, um, and there's, no, there's no instruction required. It's like you just hand them the robot and say, do you want to design a personality for them? And they're like, yes, we do. And then they instantly just figure it out. And then they basically kind of go back and forth creating different personalities for the robot. Um, so that's for for us. The ultimate goal is for kids to be able to start there and then progress through multiple kind of levels of complexity in terms of programming Romo until they're ultimately just using our SDK to create entire apps from scratch. And I think that that's so it's so important. You know, I, I, my hope for my kids is to be able to send them to the basement and you know be able to not as punishment, but uh, you know when all else fails, that they can go and create something with their own hands. And I think that you've got to stimulate that at a young age. And I'm looking at six, six yeah. and a half, and 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 uh, that, that's why you know I'm so fascinated by what you're doing, and and so fascinated by the 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 I don't know the ignition that this does for the imagination of kids right uh yeah. the same things that happened to me i grew up on the original i mean it had already finished but i mean I, when when i was a kid i watched the original star trek right and uh and i i did a a convocation speech to my graduating business class you know i graduated from the school many 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 years ago and they asked me back uh to to give that and and i, I during that speech, I talked about this amazement, which everybody was was uh, you know uh, criticizing the name of the iPad when it was coming out, and this is around that time. It's yeah. like, like, can you believe they called this thing the iPad? And and I looked at this thinking, like, y you know what? I never ever thought that I would ever see something like this ever in my lifetime. I watched it on TV, and I and I've been waiting my entire life. I don't care what it's called, man. It yeah. is something that I saw. 20 years before in a, in, on a television screen as science fiction and I'm holding it, right? And it's yeah. the same thing with what you're doing with Remotive and, and, uh, and with Romo. And I think, you know, 
I can't imagine what, what this little piece of technology is going to do to ignite the imagination of, of the next generation of makers. And that's pretty cool. Like that must fill you with, I mean, it hasn't happened yet. You're, you're in the middle of that, those early days of, of assembling, but, uh, but that's gotta be something that motivates you as you go forward. Yeah, that's the dream. It's the dream. I couldn't have said it better myself. All right. So now what about Tony Shea? I got to ask this is that uh, Tony Shea, you know, um, I guess he he uh, subscribes to the Kickstarter uh, newsletter. He gets a notification that you guys are in there, that you're selling robots. He gets fascinated. You end up living in his place. Uh, what's that about? <clears throat> so, uh, you know, without going into a lot of detail, uh, you can go check out downtownproject.com. Uh, Tony is investing a huge amount of money to basically try to build an entrepreneurial, uh, community-driven um, city from scratch in downtown Las Vegas. And it's an incredibly ambitious project. Uh, there are a lot of really awesome startups who have moved here as part of it. We were the first. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, I strongly encourage anyone who kind of looks at that website and feels like, wow, this is such an ambitious project. I'd love to be a part of it. Email me or email, uh, email someone at Downtown Project. They're just an incredibly open, ambitious, cool project where kind of like nothing is impossible. I guess that I would, I would say that is their, that is their motto. That is their slogan, is it? Nothing is impossible. Yeah. yeah. Well, Tony's always been a, an impressive guy. I mean, I, I love what he does and it seems like, um, you know, when, when I speak to entrepreneurs like yourself and, and I read things from Tony and, uh, and I see the influence that he has it, it and I've, I've spoken with many people from his companies and, and the impact is that, uh, look, it, it's great user experience, great customer experience. The customer's always first. And it seems like a lot of those lessons may have rubbed off. I mean, he talks about his manufacturing and distribution or his distribution platform um, yep. and uh, how, you know, he, he, he needed to be inside the distribution process. He had to understand it. He had to own that process. And it seems like you guys are, are kind of living that right now with your, your you know, co-founder in China and employees in China, right? Yeah, we definitely are. Um, I mean, it's hard not to pay attention to, it's hard not to pay attention to customer experience when Tony lives two floors above yeah. you. <laughs> exactly. I can, so he, he's definitely yeah. rubbed off on us in a lot of ways. The overlord of customer service. Yeah. So we, we've now spent a lot of time talking together. We didn't even touch on the fact that you went back for a second Kickstarter. And, and okay. that you raised five million dollars <laughs> to do what you're doing. Um, uh, is there anything that that came of that second? I, I mean, the only question I really want to understand is why do it a second time for the Kickstarter? Mm -hmm. The second time, so it it, it just it, Kickstarter isn't about the money. It's about it's about pre-orders and it's about testing traction for a new product. Um, so we'll probably do it a third time great. when we launch a new robot. And and that's all it is. It's just about distribution. It's about getting customers because they have a great platform. It's about distribution. It's about, di it's about distribution and finding the right kinds of people to be the first buyers of your product. And the kinds of people on Kickstarter, they're incredibly understanding. If there are bugs, they contact you and they say, hey, here's a bug. I found it. Can you fix it? Um, as opposed to somebody who buys something at Target, they're like, oh, something's wrong with it. I'm going to return it. Yeah. Um, so they're just a really active, understanding, nerdy group of early adopters. And it's just an awesome, it's awesome to launch with them before kind of going in and uh, selling into a bigger market. Oh, yeah, I think that's a very, very sound, smart strategy. Oh, Keller, I mean, I think I could talk to you all day. I said that when we met uh, in uh, in San Francisco. I'll say that every time. Um, and I'm eagerly watching this. And uh, and certainly you guys, as you scale, 5,000 or 2,200 out, you got 2,800 to go. You got 10,000 that you're going to be shipping by the end of the summer. Um, yep. And then I think it's it's just, uh, it's lights out. You guys are going to have a little, uh, you know, a little robot army in every single home <laughs> in North America. Um do you have a vision like that to say, like Bill Gates, a desktop on every, uh, you know, a desktop on every computer? Um, do you think that every household should have a have a uh, have a robot, have a Romo? Yeah, absolutely. Or I mean, or 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 several robots. I think that robots will. I, I think that there's just no question that there are things that that um, that there are things that robots can do that will make people's lives fundamentally better, uh, like connecting us, like allowing us to lead multiple, like like interact in natural ways over great geographical distances, allowing us to take tours of spaces. Um, like I should just be able to, you know, after jumping off the call with you, I should be like, oh, I want to take a 15 minute tour of MoMA. So I gotta be able to pay a couple bucks and pull out my phone and just drive around MoMA. Like there's so many things that robots can do that I think people haven't even started to begin thinking about. Um, and so it's absolutely our goal to, to, you know, as we grow and scale to build that robot that we think 
is is at a point where we're ready to just scale into every household, hopefully in the world. I love it. I love that vision. Yeah. How do people get one? So you can go to our uh, website. It's remotive.com. Uh, or you can just search for Romo or smartphone robot on Google. I think it's the first thing that comes up. Uh, right now, there is a, I think there's a short wait. Uh, we'll, we'll be shipping uh, as soon as those 2,800 robots arrive. So I think maybe a month. Um, but there are $150 on our website and, uh, we would love to sell robots to everyone, uh, everyone who's listening. Um, Romo is an absolutely awesome thing to like play with at an office or buy as a gift for a kid or, uh, to just buy, to chase your pets around at home. Um, <laughs> and he, again, and the most important thing is he's insanely simple to use. Like he is designed so that whether, you know, someone is eight years old or 80 years old or anywhere in between there, are no instructions required. It's easy. He works all the time. Um, our, our goal was really to build a robot that was, that was, that was fun, not stressful to set up. So, and you know, if, um, uh, if you don't believe Keller, when he talks about this is that, uh, I have seen it on two different occasions. I've seen Romo captivate a crowd of many people and individuals to the point where, I mean, y you have to walk around with your, with your square, your credit card tra transaction. I mean, people want to, to buy this every time. So. <laughs> we do. We usually have a square in my pocket because everybody always wants to buy a robot. So, so. take a look, go to remotive, R O M O T I V E.com. Take a look at Romo. There's a ton of videos. Just Google. If you don't, if you can't remember remotive, just Google Romo and you will see some video. Uh, and I've obviously been playing it as we've gone along here. It's been, it's such a fascinating story. And, and you will look back at this as the dawn of the age of the home <laughs> robot. Finally, it's arrived. And it's thanks to companies uh, like Keller's here, which is Remotive. Go to remotive.com. Keller, man, I can't, you spent an hour with me. I can't thank you enough for doing this. I really appreciate your time. Um, the insight, the honesty, it's been great. Uh, I can't wait to share this with everybody. And for you who are watching, um, I'd love some feedback on this. Reach out to me, Rob at Untether.tv. Keller, do you have uh, an email address you want to throw out there? Sure, uh, Keller at Remotive.com. It's easy. And and if if uh, people want to talk or have questions, feel free to email me. If I can't answer the question, I'll make I'll find someone on the team who can. That's yeah, amazing, Keller. You've been so forthcoming. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate your time. Sure thing. All right, take care, Rob. Everybody else who is listening, watching, whatever you're doing, wherever you are, hopefully it's now playing with your Romo, uh, which sounds worse <laughs> than it is. Go get a Romo. Uh, thank you for doing that. I really appreciate it. Uh, every time you spend a moment with me, I, I am uh, completely flattered. So uh, please keep spending those moments with me, and we'll see you next time on Untether.tv. Thank you, Keller. Thanks.